I have a relatively heretical view of nonfiction. I mean, I, I, I believe that all nonfiction is is a framing device to foreground contemplation. I wrote three novels, got bored with the... I just am not that much of a storyteller per se. I wasn't interested in plot, scene, setting, character, dialogue. All the people tell me these are apparently important aspects of <laughs> fiction writing. And so I just, I moved toward the, the essay form in which I could get rid of all those things and not have the reader turning pages to find out what happened next because I didn't care what happened next. I'm, I'm interested in human consciousness. And that's what the essay foregrounds. I was basically hired as a fiction writer at the University of Washington. I couldn't really read or write or teach, teach fiction anymore, so I had to reclaim some space for myself by teaching this course in which I was teaching myself and teaching my students and teaching my colleagues what it, it was I was actually interested in. And so each, each year I brought in this huge blue binder of quotes just as you say, Tom, an anthology. It, I would just throw down on the desk this big binder of quotes, everything from Schopenhauer to Degada to Gornick to Didion to Heraclitus, and just say, okay, let's talk about these. And then each year, the packet got more and more coherent. I'd get rid of repetitions, typographical errors, and then above all, of course, I started sliding quotes into categories. Stuff about genre was in a section on genre, then stuff on hip-hop, reality TV, doubt, contradiction, etc. And, you know, how does it go? You know, slowly but surely, it became a book. It became unmoored from the course pack. It seems to me like some of the sections, some of the, um, the, the sections that, that really hit me. The sections in, in this, the in new this book, book. Yeah. Um, are, are, they're kind of structured around a, a particularly potent quote. Um, and so I'm wondering if that line is th that it's more that the uh, that that the, the line saves your life. Um, I love that. Is that. I love that idea. You mean it's not so much literature so much as is, is the the line. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I didn't. I mean, I wouldn't have consciously said that, but I do know what you mean. I mean, I'm such a collector of of aphorisms and aperçus and haikus and koans and bumper stickers. I just love those lines so much. I mean, in a way, I'm kind of like this sort of boring, walking, like, quote machine. Like, some of my st students and friends and my wife and daughter kind of mock me because I always have this, I don't know if you're the same way, you know, like, I'm this, I just love these incredible quotes, you know, and I just think, what more can you say? But, um, I mean, I, I hope the book is not just simply salvation by fortune cookie but you know but I think it's an interesting point that I do often find what triggers me is a thought a quote some Nietzschean or Emersonian quote and then I use that to build something else I think that in many ways I think of how literature saved my life being a reconstitutive act, if that's the right word, you know, where I'm trying to reconstitute, like, okay, reality hunger casts this immensely skeptical light on literature, the way it's supposed to be practiced as memoir, as fiction. Okay, what is the literature I really believe in? So that's sort of what this book is. It's in some ways, a friend of mine called it sort of a surprising sequel to reality hunger, in which I wanted to show myself and and readers, like how much I love literature, how much passion was behind reality hunger. I wasn't trying to kill the patient, I was trying to save the patient. And in how literature saved my life, I'm trying to make that emphatically clear if it wasn't clear in reality hunger. I suddenly started to feel guilty about having read Rebecca's journal. Every time I kissed her, I closed my eyes and, and saw myself sitting at her desk, turning pages. I regretted having done it, and yet I couldn't tell her about it. What's wrong, she asked. I'll miss you, I said. I don't want to leave. On the plane, I wrote her a long letter in which I told her everything I couldn't bring myself to tell her in person. I'd read her journal. I was very sorry. I thought our love was still pure and we could still be together. But I'd understand if she went back to Gordon, 
and never spoke to me again. She wrote back that I should never have depended on her journal to give me strength. She'd throw it away and never write it in it again. And she wanted to absolve me, but she wasn't God, although she loved me better than God could. <laughs> Anything I said, she would believe because she knew I'd never lie to her again. Our love, in her view, transcended time and place. Well, sad to say it didn't. The night I returned from San Francisco, she left a note on my door that said only, come to me, and we tried to imitate the wild abandon of the fall semester, but what a couple of weeks before had been utterly instinctive was now excruciatingly self-conscious, and the relationship quickly cooled. She even went back to Gordon for a while, although that second act didn't last very long either. It was, I see now, exceedingly odd behavior on my part. After ruining things for myself by reading her journal, I made sure I ruined things for both of us by telling her that I had read her journal. Why couldn't I just live with the, the knowledge and let the shame dissipate over time? What was, what is the matter with me? Do I just have a bigger self-destruct button? and like to push it harder and more incessantly than everyone else? Perhaps. But also, the language of the events was at least as erotic to me as the events themselves. And, and when I was no longer reading her words, I was no longer very adamantly in love with Rebecca. This is what is known as a tragic flaw. So, it's just terribly important to me that the writer be part of the problem. That he's, you know, I, this idea I have of, you know, we're all bozos on this bus. You know, there's no one who gets out of here alive. And, you know, that I'm just very interested in sort of psychic vulnerability, writerly discomfort, readerly discomfort, um, emotional disequilibrium. <clears throat> and so I guess for me, I take quite seriously the sort of Kafka quote, which everyone quotes endlessly. And I think I quoted in this book, or Reality Hunger, I forget, of, you know, um, that, that we want a book to break the frozen sea within us, approximately. That's the line translated in different ways. But I take that quite seriously as a <clears throat> criterion for a writer to try. If you're not doing that, if you're just writing, smooth entertainment or middle brow escape or well-crafted doilies, I don't see how that's art, you know? It should absolutely, completely undermine who you think you are. That's the mark of art to me.